So now we'll move on to some other diseases which affect our children, uh, and which does so in this particular case in so many different forms. Let's begin with diseases where brain development is interrupted or injured, causing, of course, difficulties with social interaction, communication, learning, and more. Dr. Joanne Kurtzberg is a pediatric hematologist, oncologist, and director of the Pediatric Blood and, Bone, Blood and Marrow Transplant Program at Duke University in North Carolina. She's one of the leading experts in the field, and she's here today to discuss her work using cord blood stem cells for the treatment of brain injury. Please welcome Dr. Joanne Kurtzberg. Well, hello, everybody. Um, I want to thank the organizers of the meeting for inviting me to talk to you about our work with cord blood and cord blood cells to treat diseases of the brain. Um, now, cord blood um, is a non-controversial source of stem cells. In fact, um, it's the baby's blood left over in the placenta uh, that used to be thrown in the trash um, before, uh, after birth. And it turns out that you can collect the blood left over in the afterbirth and freeze it and test it and store it, probably for decades, and then use it as a source of cells for hematopoietic cell transplantation, as well as now a source of cellular therapy. And you know, everyone talks about cord blood being a bag of stem cells. And um, I have on the slide here a picture of the bag that cord blood is typically stored in, which is uh, less than the size of your hand. Um, and contains less than an ounce of blood, typically about two billion cells. But those cells are really capable of many different therapeutic actions. Um, and it's not really just a bag of stem cells, it's a bag of many different kinds of cells. So the hematopoietic stem cells, which um, are shown with the circle, um, are the cells that are used to replace the bone marrow in um, uh, the kind of transplant that um, Robin was telling you about this morning that's used for patients with cancers and other types of therapies. Um, but there are also cells um, in the cord blood that can serve almost as agents of repair by signaling cells that are already in the body uh, to repair damaged tissue. And the work I'll show you today is how we're using cord blood cells uh, to do that. Now, the very first use of cord blood um, as a therapy um, started in 1988 in the little boy shown on the left, who at the time was five years old, had a genetic disease which is fatal in early childhood called Fanconi anemia, and was a patient at Duke. And um, his bone marrow was failing. His mom happened to be pregnant with another baby. We tested that baby in utero and found she was healthy and a match to her brother. And the cord blood from that baby was collected when she was born. And the cord blood and the child uh, went to France, um, where Elian Gluckman, shown in the picture, uh, performed the first cord blood transplant in the world. And fortunately, that transplant was successful. Um, and um, the young man, um, whose name is Matthew, um, is shown with me in the picture on the right 27 years later. Um, in our clinic, everybody comes back for checkups I say till I die, <laughs> but <laughs> at least every year. And so I get to see Matthew every year, and he's doing well. And most importantly, he's, he's um, completely engrafted with his sister's cord blood in his bone marrow, his blood, and his immune system. Um, I want to point out that this was really an experiment in a child. There was very little preclinical data. There aren't good animal models for this. It was in a time when the regulations were not as strict as they are today, but, but this transplant really paved the way for the field. Um, and since that time, uh, the field has evolved. Uh, there, uh, Dr. Pablo Rubenstein started the first unrelated donor cord blood bank at the New York Blood Center in 1992. The first unrelated transplant using cord blood was done at Duke in 1993. And if you fast forward to today, there have been more than uh, 35,000 unrelated donor cord blood transplants performed around the world. There are more than 170 banks. And it's proven now that cord blood is an alternative donor for patients who don't have a match in their family or a match in the registry. It doesn't have to be completely matched. 
um, and it increase, increases access to transplantation for patients with blood cancers, uh, bone marrow failure, immune deficiency, hemoglobinopathies like sickle cell disease or thalassemia, and certain metabolic diseases. Um, the inventories around the world are um, nearly 700,000 for the public inventory and over 4 million for in the private sector where parents elect to pay a company to store their child's cord blood for their own use. Um, cord blood has the distinction of being one of the uh, first blood stem cell sources to be regulated by the US FDA. Um, and there are six uh, licensed cord blood banks in the U.S. today. Um, and um, cord blood is now being explored not only for use in hematopoietic cell therapy, but also in other types of cell therapy, which um, I'll talk about. Um, early observations showed that cord blood could be used as a donor for hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, but that cell dose was really important, and not every cord blood unit had enough cells for a single transplant. And that's still a, a subject of research today. And as I mentioned, it doesn't have to match as closely. It doesn't cause as much graft versus host disease, which you heard Dr. Scarrett talk about earlier. Um, and um, it may be associated with less relapse for patients with leukemia. Um, now, um, one of the challenges of cord blood is cell dose. And, um, one of the products that um, is being developed by an Israeli company called Gamita Cell is an expanded cord blood cell where part of the frozen cord blood is selected and expanded in culture for three weeks and then given to patients um, who need transplants. And this slide shows you in the upper line that when patients get this product, they have their bone marrow start growing back two to almost three weeks earlier than patients who get in the bottom line an unmanipulated product. And uh, development like this shows great promise uh, to help cord blood, or to use cord blood to help patients with many diseases. And at Duke, we're exploring the use of this manipulated product um, in children with sickle cell disease who have a very hard time after transplant and typically don't engraft with cord blood. And this shows you our patient Sosa who had failed another transplant and um, had had strokes and chest crises and many life-threatening complications of sickle cell disease and who came back for a cord blood transplant using NICORD and the expanded cells. And uh, on the left, she's shown when she celebrated her birthday in the bone marrow unit. And on the right, she showed a couple of years later when she was back in high school as a normal student. So we're very encouraged by this and have treated uh, seven other children um, with good results. Um, now, another area we're focusing on is using cord blood to treat children with certain inherited metabolic diseases. Uh, the diseases are lift, listed on the, uh, on the left, and um, they're all very rare. They're all fatal in infancy and early childhood, and they all cause damage to the developing brain. Um, in the red line, you can see that the survival of children now more than 10 years transplanted um, at Duke, um, who came to the transplant with early signs of disease is about 80%, and these children have good performance status. Um, and that's in contrast to the children in the green line who are children where uh, they had many symptoms of the disease before the diagnosis was made, and um, they do not do as well with transplants. So we have to pick these disease up, diseases up early. Newborn screening is one way to do that. Um, and um, but when they're diagnosed early and cord blood transplantation is used after high-dose chemotherapy, children can do well. Um, so this is a little boy with Crabbe disease whose um, older brother died when he was two and a half years old of this disease. And because of that, this child was diagnosed early. He's shown getting his line changed. Uh, this is one of the ways we support children through transplant. Um, but he did well with the transplant. He's shown in the lower panel in kindergarten and on the right with his younger brother who was also transplanted uh, for Crabbe disease 10 years later. So again, when these children are diagnosed early, they do very well. In Hurler syndrome, which on the left shows an unaffected, untreated child, if children are, treated, are not treated, they die by five years of age, usually with severe mental retardation and uh, cardiac failure. Uh, with transplant, as shown in the child in the middle, who's 10 years out, um, they can have a normal lifestyle, normal performance status. And shown on the right is uh, the intelligence or the cognitive function of 
uh, uh, the first um, 20 consecutive hurler patients we transplanted at Duke. Um, and in the dotted lines, you can see that their uh, cognitive function was falling off. Um, but And um, after transplant, it catches up. So the red line is normal or typically developing children of the same ages. And this is really sustained. So here are two of my patients now, uh, 15 and 16 years out from transplant, going to their proms this year, um, who happened to send me pictures. Um, so the girls are the hurler patients. Um, and the boys of their dates. <laughs> um, but they are in normal high school doing normal things, um, and uh, they wouldn't be alive uh, without this kind of therapy. Um, I'm going to use these this afternoon, so I, I'm just going to show you one slide here. Um, on the left is the brain of a child who unfortunately died from Crab A disease uh, 10 months after transplant. But she was a girl, and she was transplanted with a boy cord blood donor. Uh, unit, and um, this is uh, proof that donor cells engrafted in her brain. So all the green dots you see on those slides on, in those cells are Y chromosomes. So these are male cells in a female brain 10 months post-transplant after cord blood was given into the blood of the child, but they were able to, you know, the cells knew where to go and where to grow. Um, and I'm going to show these this afternoon, so, so I'm not going to talk about this now. Um, so with that um, work, we, um, we came up with the idea that maybe cord blood cells could also help the brain heal after injury. And we thought that maybe a child's own cord blood could be used in that setting and that we wouldn't have to use chemotherapy um, or any of the toxic things that are otherwise needed for a transplant. And we embarked on a program where we've now treated children with various diseases um, using their own cord blood, where we don't expect the cells to engraft and stay in their body forever, but where we expect them to instruct other cells in the brain to repair. Um, and we've conducted safety trials, um, as well as studies in children with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, congenital hydrocephalus, uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, cerebral palsy, and autism. And I'm going to show you little tidbits of results from all of those trials. Um, just so that you get a flavor of what is possible. Um, so HIE, or hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, is a disease where term babies who had normal pregnancies uh, have some event happen near to the birth where they're deprived of oxygen. And it, it causes a very severe brain injury, um, which is often fatal. But if the children live, they have severe and lifelong neurologic complications. Um, and cooling is one therapy that has been shown to be somewhat beneficial in these babies. And we tested whether if we added up a cord blood infusion from the child's own cord blood to cooling, one, was it safe? And then two, could we alter the outcome of these babies? And so this shows you results from a paper we published last year where we were able to demonstrate that twice, uh, that, that in babies who got cord blood and cooling, um, compared to babies also treated in our center but not randomized who were just cooled. Uh, we saw twice as high survival with normal function at one year of age in the babies who got their cells. And this is enough for us to go forward now and we um, were lucky to get funding from the Robertson Foundation um, to conduct a multi-center phase two randomized trial to see if we can prove that this therapy really is effective. And um, I'll say as I go along that all of these clinical trials that we're doing um, have been supported through the generosity of different foundations, predominantly the Robertson Foundation and the Marcus Foundation. And without that funding, we could not be doing this work. Um, another area we've been um, investigating is whether infusions of a child's own cord blood could help lessen the symptoms of autism in young children with autistic spectrum disorder. Um, and so we just finished a phase one trial funded by the Marcus Foundation where we treated 25 children the ages two to six with autism with an infusion of their own cord blood. And we assessed both safety and tolerability as well as um, looked at many different studies to define endpoints for larger clinical trials. 
Um, we also looked at what time frame it would be uh, appropriate to look for results in these patients. Um, and I'll tell you first that this was safe. We didn't see any adverse reactions that would preclude taking this forward. A couple of kids had mild allergic reactions to the infusions of their own cells because of one of the chemicals that's used to freeze the cells, but they were mild and reversible. And we concluded that safety was um, there and th that we could move forward into a bigger trial. And we also defined endpoints for the trial. Um, so um, this video should start, but this is a little boy, um, baseline, who had severe problems with language. Um, whoops. I don't know if you guys can make the video start. <laughs> there you go. So this is his baseline evaluation. And what you'll see if you watch this child, and there's audio with this, um, is that he doesn't vocalize, he doesn't use gestures, he doesn't emotionally engage with the testers, and he doesn't make eye contact. That's a dog? Can you see dog? Here's the same child 12 months later. Um, Ready? Yes. What is that? It's a mother. Oh, what is that? It's a little bit. 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 So you can see this child is dramatically different, and um, this is 12 months after an infusion of his own cord blood. And this is just an example of the kind of responses we saw in this therapy. And um, you'll have to take my word for it. We, we have a big team doing this, a lot of people who were skeptical to start and who did very rigorous testing to make sure that we weren't going to overinterpret or interpret um, placebo responses, but we're seeing some encouraging results. And so because of that, we're moving into another trial, um, which is depicted here, where children are evaluated, their cord blood is evaluated, and they're randomized to get a placebo, which is an infusion of pink smelly liquid, or a donor. And the donor can be their own cord blood if they have it, and if not, an unrelated donor from one of the public banks. Um, because we've shown in other studies that's safe in adults and in children um, with cerebral palsy. But these kids will cross over. So at six months, which is the end point, um, they'll come back and get a second infusion and get what they didn't get the first time. So every child will really be treated. It's just that the, the assessment of the therapy will be at the six-month time point. And 220 children will be treated over the next couple of years in that study. And then we've also performed randomized trial in children with cerebral palsy. And this is a double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover study of our autologous cord blood infusion. And we did this because when we did safety studies, um, we learned from all the parents that they thought they saw improvements in their children. And I don't question that. But in order to determine whether those improvements were really because of the cell therapy or just because of the natural development of CP, we had to do a randomized trial. So we just completed this trial of 63 patients, ages one to six, who had their own cord blood um, and who were infused with cord blood from 16 different private banks. They had to have a certain kind of CP, and again, it was randomized, and the endpoint was how their motor function changed at one and two years. And so on the left, you can see a scale that's been devised for children with cerebral palsy, they're assigned a level based on severity, and then these are like growth curves. Over the course of time, children do improve in function naturally, even when they have cerebral palsy. So we had to show benefit by saying that a child would improve 30% more than they were predicted to change um, in order to be considered a response. And um, on the right, you can see in the blue, 
the placebo children. So there was a wide range of change in the placebo children, but then in the green and the red, children who got either a low dose of cord blood cells or a high dose of cord blood cells. And the kids in the red who got what we called high dose, but which is really the same dose we use in leukemia, had statistically significant changes in their motor function above, more than 30% above uh, where they would have been predicted to be um, without the cord blood therapy. And this is showing you similar data, but in the kids who are over two years of age on the study. And again, in green, you can see that um, when they got the infused dose at the threshold or the or pre cryo dose at the threshold, uh, we defined that they had a statistically significant response and improve in, improvement in motor function. And we're hoping um, that that's enough for us to take this therapy to the clinic using autologous cells, although we don't know. But we're also now testing donor cells. Um, and you can see in the red line here that cell dose really matters. Um, this is kids with leukemia getting cord blood cells, but this line in red showing improved survival with that dose is the same dose that was affected in the kids with cerebral palsy. So now we're using that in kids with autism as well. And this shows you connectivity analysis on MRI, looking at the one-year scan, overlaying the baseline scan. Red means increased fibers. So you can see on the three top panel and three responding kids who got high doses of cord blood cells that they made new connections in their brain and that's why their function was better. And that's compared to the lower panels where there are three other kids who did not respond and who did not make new fibers and did not have increased function. So we have a good biomarker to measure this as well. Um, and then this is um, one of the CP patients Baseline, you can see this little boy walking with a walker with braces. He can't walk alone. And one year later, you can see that same little boy able to walk independently and even climb over the bar. So this is above and what, beyond what would have been expected for a child with this form of CP um, in this given time frame. Um, we're now moving into allogeneic cells because it's really important for everybody to have access to this therapy and not everyone can save their cord blood at birth or, a sore, or even afford to save their cord blood at birth. So we tested allogeneic cells or donor cells in stroke patients and it was safe. And we're planning the studies I showed you in autism and also donor cells in cerebral palsy. Um, so I'll summarize by just saying that the cord blood journey is 27 years young. Uh, we know how to bank cord blood better than we used to. We can manipulate it in ways we couldn't in the past. And I think that um, the use of cord blood in cell therapies and regenerative medicine as an emerging field now has enormous potential and will be one of the true big advances in the next 10 years. And I have to end by just saying, I think one of the other speakers said it takes a village, but it really does take a village. I, I get to be the ambassador and talk about our work at Duke, but I have a, a fantastic team of several hundred people who work with me, uh, taking care of patients, banking cord blood, testing things in the laboratory, doing all the studies we need in the autism patients, the brain injury patients, um, in order to prove our points. And then we have funding from several foundations, um, and, and I mentioned the Robertson Foundation, the Marcus Foundation in particular, which has enabled this work. The kids on the right are three kids that I took with me to the FDA for the hearing about licensure of cord blood to make sure that the metabolic diseases got covered. The little girl in blue was transplanted at 19 days of age for Crabbe disease after her sister died at age one. The little girl in black is the little girl, one of the girls going to the prom, and the little boy in the plaid shirt has adrenal leukodystrophy and was transplanted at two and a half years of age and got up in front of the FDA and said, I, I think I hear you people saying that you don't think cord blood works for kids with uh, adrenal leukodystrophy, but I respectfully beg to disagree. And <laughs> he went on to speak and an FDA approved an indication that enabled cord blood to be used that way, which is really important so that insurance companies and healthcare payers pay for the treatment. Um, so I think I've showed you science, advocacy, um, policy, regulations, and all the things that go into using um, therapies like this. But remember, children are our future and we should definitely be doing this work. So thank you. <laughs>